Hello, welcome back to Adagio Life for our fifth episode on the Bach Cello Suites. Today, the menuet, or I should say the menuets from the first suite. Our guest in about 15 minutes will be Amandine Beyer, extraordinary violinist. Let's have a go at the minuet first. <laughs> So, as you see, a dance in three beats, one, two, three, one, two, three, rather uplifting, rather uh, uh, in a rather middle quick tempo, although there are minuets in many different tempos. Maybe Amandine will tell us more about this, uh, about the, the history of the menuet and its variations through the times. But uh, what will be particular about these penultimate dances in all the suites is that they are a gender called galanterie. And I suppose this comes uh, from society at first, that uh, in, in the French understanding of the, of the term galanterie, uh, uh, it has in itself um, a connotation of a certain, I would almost uh, say a certain, maybe a bit conservative ordonnancement of society, where the man is supposed to open the door for the lady, or, you know, it's about this reflection on duality. And there are many ways, of course, to apply this duality and this galanterie in musical terms, as we will see along the six suites. So, again, the idea is to play with, one could say, either oppositions or poles that will interact with each other. In this case, you have heard this uh, first menuet, it is uh, very positive and uplifting, and inevitably the Menuet too will have a rather introverted character. <laughs> on this duality uh, is in, in basically in all the different ways that are at his disposal. The first one is the tonality. G major for the minuet one, G minor for the second minuet. He will apply this system to the first three suites and then for the last three suites from suite four he will not anymore do um, an opposition of uh, tonality but he will use other means that we will explore. So, tonality in this case, as you see, very different. Then, the motif. The motif of our first minuet is an arpeggio, an ascending arpeggio that we have basically from the prelude. If you, you remember. Right, of course. So, it starts with this motif that goes up. And throughout this minuet, we will have this motif that goes up. Yeah, and then second half. Yeah, and then... Uh, so always these three notes going up. The second menuet, as you already guessed, I'm sure. So... Our G minor chord is played from the from the top note, and not anymore from the bottom note. So there is, that's a second opposition. The third one is the way he uses embellishments, ornaments. I'm talking now not about the ones that we can improvise as an interpreter, but the ones that are written by the composer. So for after doing in the minuet one, after doing his arpeggio, <laughs> embellishment, <laughs> goes around this upper note 
in a way that is, I find, like a butterfly, something that gives a, a, an energy, a, a buoyancy, an English word I like. Um, in the minuet two, on the other hand, it starts with a, with a, in a way, with an embellishment of this main note B flat. But as you can see, in this way, it's more like a plaintive. Uh, always a half step in both cases, going down and up. So again, yes, embellishments, ornaments on both sides, but in a very different with a very different outcome. And the last very clear way that, in, which might be one of the most important, uh, that he uses to play on this contrast is the bass line. And here again, we have in the minuet one, uh, a sort of an, an ascending bass line that will go from G, that will make a, to D major at the end of the, of the first part and it will be an ascending line and on the contrary in the minuet 2 it will be this descending line which is almost almost like a passacai it will not be a passacai in this case but the line is totally like a passacai so I play the whole thing now So he really tries to, you know, to really stick to the book in this uh, first suite. Uh, I remember we mentioned this also in the in the Sarabande last time um, that in this first suite he really wants to be very clear about the um, how do you say the, the challenges that he gives himself. You know, that's going to be minuet one. I'm going to use so in this case with the bass line, very strict, going from D. <laughs> In the first part, in the first minuet, and going also from G to D, also from the tonica to the dominant, but with the descending line. Um, I remember this is one uh, of the dances where my experience with Anteresa de Kersmaker and the project Mitten was uh, decisive in helping me to feel these two different types of menuets um, because in these dances Aunt Teresa would ask her dancer to really in a way uh, uh, stick to the book and walk the bass line um, in a very strict way and in the first menuet they would they would give this sort of energy that uh, <laughs> So I was really relating to them uh, in this way to, to, to give steps that would lift them. And in the minore, in the minuet two, uh, uh, in this case, uh, Mika, who, was the, who is the one dancing the first suite, uh, would, would have a very slow paced steps, uh, very close to the floor. And that would really help me to feel this also in the way I play. Which brings me to a question, one of your questions. By the way, I know I repeat myself, please keep sending your questions. It's very helpful, it's very inspiring. And, and uh, I'm so happy about, about this response. So thank you, thank you. Please know that whenever you send me something that uh, fills me with uh, buoyancy again. So today a question from Jeffrey Wang. We already had a question from Jeffrey, I remember, in one of the first episodes. And his question about uh, these particular kind of dances was this. About Tempi in the galanteries, is there any specific rule one should consider regarding the relationship between part one and two? This we have just discussed. For instance, how much can they vary? How much can you vary from one menuet to the, to the other one? And I guess uh, your question, Jeffrey, is probably in many different ways. How much can they vary in character? This we have just discussed. Can they vary in tempo? 
can they vary in the way you play? And this, I would like to, to, to um, tell my conviction, is that you can vary a lot, you will feel very free to vary a lot, including in timing, including in tempo, if whatever you do comes from the dancing feeling, from what is, how is the menuet grooving, how is it moving us, so so if you try to look for this uh, very strong contrast which, which the composer wants and wants you to do um, and if you try to look for it while always leaving it in relation with your dance, I think you cannot make big mistakes if you go at it that way. That's, that's um, what I'm really, really convinced about. Um, one thing still about technically how to apply what we just talked about. How do you play uplifting with the bow? How do you play sad? How do you play more? So, and I would say, try to look at your arm like it is the reflection of your soul. This is ideally what we are trying. That, that's uh, our mantra, I think, as string players um, all our life. So, um, and that means in the first minuet, I will want my right arm to be to be very free, to give, to give, to have, I can give a, a lot of bow. And as you, I don't know how much you can hear with the type of communication we have here as, at distance, but I sometimes let the bow float over the strings very freely. And in the minuet too, when I try to express something where, where the soul is not as free and you know, as liberated. Uh, well, it would be the same here. I will, I will not let my arm just go like this. I will, I will rather let my arm go in contact with the sound, let a bit more of the weight of my arm, my arm will feel heavier and therefore it will be also slower. Uh, I mean, the, the bow speed will be slower. Mm. So, I hope this is helpful. Uh, um, one little detail I forgot, uh, and I wanted to mention to you before we go uh, and talk with Amandine. Uh, even though it's, it's a bit of a step back in my discourse and I apologize for this. Um, if you look at the last eight bars of the first minuet compared, compared with the last eight bars of the second minuet. Um, first minuet. Everything is in ascension, ascension, ascending. Uh, the motive, of course, yeah, but also the bass. So we really w went up, and in the last eight bars of the second menuet, our bass line. We are in minor, that's one thing, but also our bass line is going and the very last thing I will say, I promise, and then we go to our talk with Amandine, is that of course it wouldn't be Bach if this duality would be 
100%. Because I think for Bach and for all these great geniuses, life is not black and white. Nothing is 100%. We are always on this line looking for what truth, or in this case music, could be. So, and in the second half, the second part of the second menuet, it's very interesting how Bach actually uh, uses the ascending material of the first menuet, uh, first, uh, first note of the second half of first menuet is uh, and first note of the second part of the second menuet. And here he gives us, through this actual motif from the first menuet, there is an interaction. It's not simply menuet one, menuet two, because that would be less interesting. And see how through this interaction we even get a little major episode. <laughs> which is one of my favorite passages in the whole first suite because we explore B flat major and it's the only time of course that we are allowed access to this key through the G minor and and I find it such a such a generous and, and touching moment wonderful I think today for one of the first times in these first episodes I have managed to uh, be in time to welcome uh, our guest, uh, dear Amandine, are you there? Dear Amandine, I am approaching, uh, putting on my headphones. Oh, yes, here you are. Welcome, dear Amandine. Yes. Uh, Amandine Bayer. Hello, uh, Hello, Amandine. So, it's so wonderful. Thank you, thank you for taking the time to be here. So, I, I want to say a little anecdote before we go in the, in the real subject is that last time I mentioned you because um, you taught me something very important about ornaments once when we shared a concert in Paris. And I, I told this story, you know. And then immediately there was um, uh, uh, someone, um, sorry, uh, I forgot the name, but uh, made a comment on my post on Facebook saying, ah, Amandine, Amandine Bayer, she's really, she's ah, so inspiring. She's the, just simply the best. So immediately, um, so I'm so happy that you are here uh, today in the wake of this uh, great enthusiasm that you provoke in this. So, I have a first maybe banal question, dear Amandine. The, the, the cello suite for us cellists, there are, there are uh, some people call it the Bible, some, whatever. They are with us our whole life because of course, I think for many different reasons, because we don't have such an extensive repertoire as, as uh, the violin has and probably as, a, and of course, as the piano and everything, but also uh, because they are very accessible in a way in their language, so that in the history, um, uh, if, you know, Casals uh, and today, of course, Yoyoma, uh, they, they take this, um, these suites, they, or took in the in case of Casals, these suites as like, uh, like as a message of peace that is universally uh, uh, heard and that is universally accessible so they, they they have so they have this place in our, our life which is so not only very central but uh, in a way very philosophical how is it for the partitas and sonatas for violin which are so um, uh, so rich so dense but I have the feeling maybe even more ambitious than the cello suites how is it for you as a violinist I think uh, perhaps people will find, will find it very strange, but I really like the cello suites much more than the violin pieces. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> just now, it, of course, we can, with the music, what's the good is that uh, we can never say there is a winner or there is a loser. It's always a matter of moment and taste. But of course, what you said about the suite cello, um, exactly. Also, what Anne Teresa said the first day that you taught to them this lum luminous simplicity and engagement. I think it's where Bach is really for me at his best for me when he, he managed to have a very simple way to do to to say great things. 
because with the violin, of course, it's more ambitious, but um, in a way, sometimes we get lost into the difficulty for my taste. It's much more a challenge. When I hear, or sometimes I practice it a little bit on the viola, when I hear the cello suite, I feel comfortable, I feel dancey, I feel I want to listen to it, I want to listen the first, the second, the, in the disorder, and if I hear the violin or if I play, it's not that I suffer, but each time it's like, like much more um, how we manage to do it, much more how we perform it. So it's more how we find the trick to add, to, to, to go over the difficulty, and sometimes we just smash our face on all the chords. And uh, of course, it's because of the nature of the instrument, the violin, had for Bach uh, um, um, quality, it, it's, we can play chords, but it's much more difficult, I think, with the cello. So it's uh, because of the, it's a huge, a huge dimension, it's much bigger. And um, so Bach said, wow, oh, wonderful, I have four strings, I can do four note chords everywhere. <laughs> but I think sometimes he overlaps the fact that it's not very easy and it's not very funny also. And uh, so when he had, the, I think he had in, in mind the cello, he had it is um, harmony fulfilled by the, by the bass register of the cello. So he, for him, I think the harmony is really so important in this bass line you always speak about. So this kind of sub line that it's, it's just always there in the cello is really in the nature of the instrument. In the violin, it could be, but it's not so evident. And then he said, okay, I, I have a little bit bass, but I have all chords and I have also soprano. So we had many times three chords, three note chords of four note chords. And that's why we had on, not only suite, but part, that means partita, that's the same, but also sonata. And that's when the thing began to be very tricky because we have three fugue. And you spoke a bit, uh, you have a little like a uh, uh, fig in the, in the fig suite when we, we spoke, um, I think with Pierre Laurent and And of course it's wonderful because it's just like this kind of uh, brainstorming about note and, and themes and that. But with the problem the violin is he, he goes through for pages and pages and sometimes I'm just jealous about cello player. Yeah, the, the the C major fugue. I don't know how you how you guys can 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 do that. This is just like uh, <laughs> unimaginable for us. But um, I have another question, um, um, Amandine, because you uh, also had before me a few years before me uh, a wonderful experience with Anne Teresa de Kersmaker with Partita, and then you had after me, yet again, uh, this uh, wonderful journey with the Brandenburg Concertos, um, with your ensemble. And uh, I would like to pass on to you a question from Nirina, who asked uh, me, how has this interaction with Anne Teresa, with the dancers, uh, influenced your playing? And this is something I talked about a little bit in, the, in one of the first two episodes. But uh, could you say something about that in your case? Yeah, uh, of course, with a lot of pleasure. Uh, I think for me it was a bit like for you, uh, the meeting with Anne Teresa and Rosa's team. And uh, just by, um, in my case, I began with Anne Teresa alone and she was with Boris Charmat, who is another dancer who was not in the company at this time, but also a great choreographer and a wonderful person. So. We were three on stage, two dancers and a violin. And finally, I felt release of this weight of the piece on my shoulder that we, I think we all carry, the violinist. And I encourage all people, all violinists, first to play a lot the cello suite and to play a lot of simple jigs and courant and menuet, because you just perform wonderfully the menuet. And I was looking in my image of that's the only um, Manuel we have in the in the three part the three suite we have. And it's all full of double stops. So I, I would like to play tam ta da tam tin ta de tin tin tam tin tin but they tan kra ta kra de kra ta kra and then it's just like uh, sometimes just a nightmare. You just begin very fresh and very enthusiastic and after three bars you are done. So 
Um, with Partita, I only played on stage the only, but it was enough for me. The D minor, but twice in the in the in the in the evening. And uh, it was amazing because, as you said, it's like. Chamber music, you said it in the first one. You spoke about this playing with the steps of the dancers or having this this rapper, this, um, this preference, I don't know anymore of, <laughs> of English, this meeting with a, with a dancer or with two dancers or even if a group with the Grand Bourgeois. But you can um, imagine your music into the space. And that's first, you are not alone, so it's a lot of release. And second, instead of I, I like I like strings. I, I love instruments anyway. I love music, but I, I, I'm really fond of uh, instrumental music because I love the movement we have. And violin is quite a uh, quite a visual instrument, but cello even more. So you have this space in, into around you. And with the violin, sometimes a bit more uh, seen. But and also, it's when you see where we play, it's just like two, three, four centimeters here and two there. And in this small space, you have to do many, many tricky things. And to see the music unfolded on stage, that to see that this, my menuet, or oh, I was not playing. Yeah, when we play one before, we have menuet. And that this um, this line you are, you are speaking about sometimes is just in our mind or just in the string, just um, in here, like up and down. It can be really forwards, backwards, turn, jump, roll. And it's amazing because then, of course, we know. But sometimes we know things, but until we see it or we feel it on stage, it's such. So I really recommend to all people to have an experience with this suite with other people. You can do with dancer. You can do with puppets. You can do this sometimes because they are and mostly we have problems. But on oh no, Sarabande, instead of playing you alone, you play with a colleague. So he's playing the bass, or you play, you play with a cello. You you really invest your mind in, into the, oh, you sing for you. I'm always singing for me the bass line. And uh, that's much more fun, really. And it's, yeah. I think it's really important for me to have fun in this piece and to not forget why, ah, and, and then, sorry, the last thing, um, it's chamber music, but it's also, as you say, for the suite and the partita, it's dance music. And for me, it's very important when we speak about Baroque music to have this sociality, um, why we play and for whom. And also if sometimes with Bach, of course, it's like uh, we always say, it's not really a dance, it's really figurative, it's not anymore a dance, but still, I mean, of course, perhaps the people will not dance directly, directly perhaps it had a, He's, he was a great, he was a genius, of course, but he was a great um, resume of his the music history. So perhaps he, he didn't really compose, sing to dance, but he has this, his dance in his memories. So he, he wanted to, he knows, he knows how to do to make the people, that was, a, what was the choreography really like? In the menuet is very, always a French menuet that was in the front, in the back and then you turn and then it's over the first part is always eight parts and it's forever and it's so nice to have it and to know that you are not alone and people will be there not to listen if you make a mistake but just to dance or imagine the dance and uh for me this this uh, purpose of the music not only pure music of course it's pure and amazing and fantastic and in the mind and the bible and everything but also very concrete music to enjoy and not too much to suffer. My goodness, I'm on so much stuff in what you just said. Thank you so much. It's fantastic. I, I uh, so uh, I want to to catch on some of the words you said and, and just repeat them because they they speak to my heart. So, um, uh, dear friends out there, sing, dance, and I also love love what you said about. You know that at first, you know, we, we think we have this bow on this very little space to, to, to go back and forth, as you said. And then that made me uh, think of what Sandor Weg said. You know, he said, the bow is round. The bow is round. So when you play, think, don't, don't think 
back and forth in straight lines, go, go in rounds like dancers. Now for our last question, um, dear Amandine, I would like to actually read um, some questions from, uh, well, from two persons uh, who sent me uh, questions, Hike and Camille Jerez Aguilar. I apologize for the pronunciation, somebody from South America, obviously. And uh, both questions are about um, uh, modern instrument, baroque instrument, gut strings, things. So I read, I read them quickly. One, uh, the question by Haik is quite uh, substantial. I would like to state rather a general question about Bach's cello suites. Ideal would be to play them on authentic instruments, on my current point of view, with baroque bow, gut strings, etc., which brings us certain technical tasks completely different from modern cellos. So the question is how to find the right balance playing on modern instruments with contemporary methods, but yet not losing the pure baroque pronunciation. What would be your thoughts, advices, about it for people who are constantly in search of it. That was Hike, and I put in the basket the question by Camille or Camille, Camille, I don't know how to pronounce it. At the moment of working on these Baroque dances, I'm aware that I have a modern cello and modern bow. How should I guide my interpretation? So I think this is something anyways that I will have to, to, uh, to go into examples in some other uh, uh, episodes and everything, but I thought since we have you, um, uh, Amandine, you have you you play. I think you play them. I have played them for for very long. The suites on gut strings for many years, uh, and I still do sometimes. But because I have been going into this, uh, doing the whole cycle and not changing instrument to the five string instrument for the six suite and all these things, so I'm doing all these compromises and these. It, in my capacities, uh, has to be on modern cello, and 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 of course, I having remembering what Harmoncourt said that it's not about what on what instrument you play, but how you play it. Nevertheless, I find these questions so interesting and so uh, important, uh, and I I have always heard you play this repertoire on gut strings. Do you? Is it always the case? And, and how do you deal with that? Uh, are you here? You I... me? Yes. Because sometimes my my, my Yes, I lost you. And now, now I see you. Yes. Yes, and yes. now I hear you well. So it's a just string attitude. <laughs> Some per parasite. Okay. I think you you gave a, a part of the of the answer. There is. I think there is no answer because it's, of course, what I really liked with all the movement with uh, high, that means, uh, uh, high historical uh, informed practice and gut strings and research. It's fantastic. It's my world. It's my work since years. So I cannot say it's nothing, but it's, it was um, by chance I, I came into it. And then I stayed there just because I tell you, really, because in a way it is easier. I just show you something. I don't know for the cello, but I took my, I have my Baroque basic violin forever, like my, my instrument, I almost play, almost play every time. And I, I, can't, I don't know if you can see it, that the bridge is very, very flat. And I have my, the bridge is for people, the bridge is this, this piece. Um, I took my, quite modern instrument. I don't know, I you perhaps cannot appreciate it very, and it's not really like a modernist transition. So, and the bridge is much more like that. And it's really, and and the other part is, that's my modern bow. And that's my standard Baroque bow, completely other aerodynamic. So a very thin and another curve and very, very, very light. And if I have to say, it's much easier to play this repertory with this instrument, just because the bow is lighter 
and because the, the bridge is flatter. And then the bridge flat, that means you have you can play more strings together without getting too much into cracks and problems. And the first day, I think, or second day I saw you playing, you, you spoke about this movement you have to do, like the violin, we have to go up and down and this. And sometimes if it's flatter, it's just a bit, everything a bit nearer. And also the bow is lighter, so everything is a bit easier. So nevertheless, gut strings are sometimes a nightmare. I just say it, but they are also a very, they are very good teachers because you learn a lot with gut strings. You learn about your nerves. You learn about the weather. <laughs> you learn to deal with many, many, many organic things that's not steel, but that really like it was alive at one point. So it's a, it's a mix of very good and best things. And I just encourage the people, if they have the occasion, like you had, just to have a taste of it. Because it's, 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 it's a pity to die <laughs> without to try it. And, uh, but then, and, but really, I, 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 that's really my opinion. Just now, I, perhaps I will change in, in a few years, but it's about commodity. Um, it's about your life, what you do, what you, I mean, I can imagine you have to travel. You have, uh, if it's, I, I, I can, I can even not imagine how you do with the cello. And if you have, to, if, if you have to have two cello, but you, because this day you play Bach, but the second day you have to play something else. And I mean, sometimes it's just not possible to have like always a perfect setting. And also because we are human. And for me, I cannot. I made a, I made a choice because I cannot play gut string a day and another day. I'm not so good, and I cannot be specialist in every field. So I had I had a moment to choose, and uh, I'm happy with my choices for now. But I encourage people to be curious, and then uh, a lot also to not be um, not feel ashamed if they don't think they have the right setup. Because if I I mean, and for the cello, I think it's much much better because. Um, it, I don't know how it is, but you don't have these all chords and the dynamic of the instrument, I think, because everything is a bit bigger, you can find this light. I don't know why, but I have the impression the lightness come a bit easier because sometimes if it's here, if it's heavy or light, it's very complicated because we are always to compensate. If it's a bit like more under and like cello or harpsichord or piano or that, I have the impression is I don't say it's easier. <laughs> Your job is easier, but in a way I think it's, it's more friendly to the modern instrument. For the violin, it's really easier in a way for the for the the gut, and then you can carry more fast, more easily more violin. But if you don't have, I mean, if you live in South America and it's a nightmare with the weather, and um, because it's too humid, or too hot. And then you feel uh, your bow is not, uh, you couldn't manage to have a barrel bow of your dreams. Also, it's, they are much cheaper. So, <laughs> so uh, I think it's important you don't feel wrong. Because I, I, I got many, many calls or many, uh, last, last week I had a very nice meeting on, um, by internet with a wonderful modern violinist. And her big concern was to make a mistake. Because she's so good with her instrument as a modern violinist, and she thought she cannot, she's not allowed anymore to touch Bach because if she doesn't do this and those and that. Uh, we are in the 21st century. There are plenty of things are available. So uh, um, tutorials. You, you, uh, I really loved. I saw the three, four first episode of your um, action on internet. Uh, you have uh, recordings, video. Uh, um, Chinese bows, uh, well, now just uh, or instruments. Uh, people getting, uh, I, I have friends in Italy or even in the world doing uh, synthetic gut string, ex especially for people having a problem with due to the weather or not enough money to afford this because these strings is just a huge money. Every I, <laughs> I buy strings like crazy because it just get broken every time. So um, everything in the, in the world, we have a lot of things are possible. So don't feel you 
don't feel upset. Sometimes there is too many choices, but you it's music. You can do what you want, actually. And you said it before with the tempo and the rubato in the menuet. And if you use more bow and less bow, if you like it, well, just go for it. I mean, uh, and you you play now with modern cello, but I'm completely happy to listen to you. I will not say, oh, no, I cannot listen to it. Uh, well, it's your fantasy and it's your world. And uh, I'm teaching in a very purist school in Basel. And I love it because, of course, I think there is important. We have place like museum or place like school where people are, in, in a way, they. Je sais pas comment dire en anglais. It's they sur les valeurs. On values, they they want to go in depth in the. Yeah, and that's fantastic and that's important. But we we cannot be always so perfect. So all over the world, there is a lot of uh, people. And uh, keep, I say to all people, keep going, keep playing and keep trying because this music is, is, is a treasure and you can play this. And also, I for, before you cut me, because I'm speaking too much, uh, um, I will I, I, say it because, of course, the gamba players, they have a lot of um, a repertory for gamba with this dance suite, a lot of suite. And violin, well, gamba and violin, it's not, um, we have also a lot, almost never alone because no, nobody was like Bach and wanted to make so many chords. So a lot of this is with continuo, but play a lot of music around Bach to have this understanding of this, of the flow of the phrase, of the music, not, and then go slowly or directly, but nearby, you, you spoke a lot about this, this small river or huge river that can be uh, Bach, no? And there is many other rivers in the in this in this um, time. You have plenty of French. A lot of this um, of this music is coming from French suite dance. So you have Rebel and uh, uh, Franker and uh, a lot of people writing amazing things. And if you play Lully and Mare and uh, but you have also Spanish music and uh, you have uh, Italian music. And playing scordatura, we sometimes we think it's only Bach in the cello made something, and perhaps Bieber, but plenty of people just also Vivaldi and also Schmelter and also a lot of people with Maya just uh, investigated with the instrument and with the tuning. So play with your instrument. Uh, sometimes I, I discovered it late, and sometimes a bit, I'm a bit afraid or lazy to do it. But uh, I think it's a thing. Play the listen the transcription. I was. I think the first time I heard um, the E major prelude, the violin, there is the same for organ. It's a, it's a symphony of a very a, a huge cantata, Viva. And I just discovered it. I was 35, or I don't know. And it's a pity because it makes your brain so huge to listen. It's with three trumpets and oboe and a huge core and the big organ solo and uh, yeah, and sometimes Bach wanted to put it in a small box like a violin, but you 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 spoke a little bit. I think I didn't remember when about this transcription. It's it's amazing to listen to this transcription of Bach. There's the same piece in 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 different uh, yeah. picturings or <clears throat> different shape. And yeah, yeah, so and he was himself. Don't be, don't, mm -hmm. No shame, no shame, and no, no, not be afraid because it's only music. Fantastic! Thank you so much, Amandi. It's it's fantastic because uh, one can hear in your words this extraordinary um, generosity that you have in your playing. So it's uh, that was so good to have you today on the show. So thank you so much. Dear friends out there, we see each other very soon because the next um, the next session will not be on Tuesday, but on Monday already. So the day after tomorrow, uh, we will talk about the jig of the first suite and uh, my guest will be Emmanuel André. See you soon. Bye bye.